Hello, everybody, and welcome to this new FACT webinar. We are back on track with the, with webinars in, in English after a complete series of webinars in French that you can actually see on our YouTube channel. If you just go to YouTube and write FACTU, you can see all the webinars. But today, uh, here with us, and it is my, my great, great pleasure to introduce you to my good friend, Dale, Dale Stoltzfus. Hello, Dale. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And for accepting this uh, small challenge that the fact you propose you. Dale, Dale will be, I, I will not introduce Dale in detail because I know that as part of his presentation, he will talk a little bit about himself and his, his story, but I just want you to, to tell you the, the title. I'm, I'm just going to share my screen now. So if you allow me. There we go. So the title for our webinar today is Draft Horses and Mules Among the Amish of North America. Dale, once again, thank you so much for, for joining us and uh, just let me know when to change the slides, okay? There we go. Okay. Yep. Are we good? We're good. Okay. Well, thank you, Zhao, and uh, thank you for this invitation to uh, meet with folks from FECTU and to do this uh, presentation. I, uh, I'd like to compliment FECTU for the work that it does in, uh, in, in Europe and beyond. And um, I, I, I do, I, I, I value my personal acquaintance with uh, Zhao and Pitt. Um, I met Pitt at, uh, I think, a Horse Progress Day's pitch lecture from the Netherlands, uh, your past president. Um, uh, at a Horse Progress Day is here. I'm not sure how many years ago now, Pitt, but um, we've seen each other quite often. And, and Pitt was the person who introduced me to Zhao a number of years ago when I was at uh, Fertigstar in, uh, in Dorntrup, uh, Germany. So just starting off with a, a personal note here, um, and my personal involvement with draft horses uh, began, um, there you go, uh, um, I bought a pair of Belgian mares in 1988, uh, and, and that led me to become immersed in the North American draft horse activities. Uh, I have always liked horses, but I uh, bought Belgian mares so that I could hook them up to a as a team to a wagon and take my family with me uh, on rides and family, friends, and so on, uh, rather than just being out by myself or riding with a bunch of other people if I had uh, riding horses, pleasure horses. So that's what led me into draft horses. I also had a personal acquaintance with Elmer Lapp, who uh, hosted the very first Horse Progress Days. I don't have, I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with the, the event Horse Progress Days. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But that uh, purchase of uh, Belgian mares in 1988 is what brought me uh, lots of uh, satisfaction and happiness over the years. Horse Progress Days was one event I was deeply involved with. The other uh, was the uh, Pennsylvania Draft Horse Sale, which I helped to run for 18 years, which was held annually at the uh, Harrisburg facility. Harrisburg is our state capital, capital of Pennsylvania. And, uh, sorry. Um, and I helped to run that. We, we would sell maybe 250 draft horses in a, in a, at a time, some, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, and it became a, a regional important in the, in the uh, actually in the, the broader industry way far beyond just Pennsylvania. And so uh, this picture that we have here now shows some of my mares and foals. Uh, I have uh, ever since then, 1988, I kept uh, breeding young animals and I, 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 do, I do get a, a, a lot of satisfaction from training and using my own horses. And I, uh, one thing that I might just mention is uh, uh, I, I have always liked horses a lot. Uh, I like all animals, but especially horses. And one thing that I think of sometimes is my mother had told me when I was at, when I was an adult about something that happened when I was out picking strawberries with her when I was still preschool. And that is that uh, I, I didn't even know what Amish people were, in spite of the fact that I live in the midst of of, uh, of an Amish community here, where there are many many Amish. But I was too young to even know what a I think an Amishman was, or a horse and buggy, but apparently a, an Amishman went by in a, in a horse and buggy, and I told her, I, I observed that, and I told my mother that when I'm big, 
I'm going to have horses and I'm going to have hair on my face. And so here we are. Uh, my wife has never seen me in the, in 40 years. We've been married for almost 50 years without a beard. So that, that uh, prophecy was fulfilled. That's a little bit of my story of how I got involved with uh, draft horses here in North America in, in the U.S. So I do live in the midst of uh, the largest Amish farming community in the world. I have a personal Amish heritage, although my uh, my great grandfather left the Amish uh, church for a more what we call a less strict uh, uh, church uh, when before long before I was born. And just here's a here's a picture of uh, of the Anabaptist gorge. Go ahead, Jow, with that next picture. Um, the Anabaptist gorge, the stones that you see. Uh, if you want to flip that picture, Jow, to the next one. There you go. That's uh, in Switzerland near uh, the town of Cortillary. I visited there. I forget which what year it was now, but the last time I was at horse at the Strike Ferda, and the, the gorge is where the Amish people uh, went, uh, Anabaptists went to get away from persecution in Switzerland. It was way high up on the mountain. And uh, the gorge is where they met for their church services and their weddings and special occasions. Um, they were, the Amish, uh, the Amish faith was actually birthed in 1693 in Switzerland. So actually this state that you see here on this rock, we don't know if it was uh, an Anabaptist, Anabaptist person who inscribed that date or not, but um, the Amish actually would not yet have been in existence uh, when that date was inscribed on that rock. Um, and the Amish migrated to the American colonies in the mid 1700s. They came looking for land, for farming opportunities, and they actually can, they came to escape some 250 years of persecution from uh, religious authorities in, in, in uh, Western Europe, especially uh, Switzerland. Um, and then, uh, so that's a little bit of history uh, of how the Amish got here to, to uh, North America, but, and, and we don't know of any Amish that are left in Europe these days, but uh, there are somewhere between 250,000 and 300,000 in, uh, in North America these days, uh, at, the, at the present time. So um, horses, horses in the Amish community, how did that happen? Well, in the early 1900s, when, when automobiles and tractors were combustible engine was coming into play in, in uh, most communities, the Amish leadership agreed among themselves or decided among themselves that they would forego the use of uh, automobiles and tractors and they would use horses for farming in the fields. Here's another picture of uh, the uh, Swiss uh, plate, this, the, the, the mountaintop near Cordillary, uh, Switzerland where the Amish or Anabaptists actually uh, lived and farmed. And I might say the story that I got when I was in Switzerland uh, to uh, visit this place from people who lived, a, a farming couple who lived nearby here was that um, the Anabaptists were, were, uh, um, were sort of ostracized to this difficult area to farm and they cleared the stones off the land, the rocks off the land made, made uh, you can see in the background there, there's some rock, rock fences. And they made the land uh, arable and profitable and started to make cheese and and uh, and would take the cheese down in the valley to the villages to sell it and actually made a very uh, profitable or, or made themselves useful and and uh, became appreciated for their cheeses and they still are that area still uh, to this day is uh, well known for its Gruyere cheese. So why did the Amish, uh, why did they decide to uh, not use automobiles, not use, and, and only use horses uh, for their uh, forward power? Well, the decision is based on their biblical understanding of being separate from the world. This is what the scriptures teach. There you see a picture of an Amish woman in southern Indiana in her carriage and buggy, or horse and buggy. Um, and so they, they decided that this would be a, a way that, that they would stay separate from the world. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and I would just say that we all would know and agree that, that it's unlikely that the, uh, 
that the Amish would have, have uh, survived here in the 21st century. And not only survive, but, but they are thriving actually. And the, but the outside pressure is always very strong. There's always the threat of acculturation of the Amish. There's the temptation of, of acculturation. Um, but the strength of the community is, is built on these outside boundaries that the Amish have agreed that they will live by. And I've all, people, we'll talk a little bit more about this too, the uh, inconsistencies maybe that, that you might observe if you, uh, if you observe the Amish up close. But the, important, the boundaries are so important and because that's what makes them a community. That's what keeps them uh, together, keeps them in small communities. And, um, and it's steeped in tradition and culture, of course, but it springs from deeply held religious understandings. So some of the Amish distinctions, uh, and many of you may know them, but uh, they, are home, they, they wear home, plain homemade clothing or uh, and they wouldn't go to the shopping mall and buy clothing usually, but they make clothes, clothing for each other. Or uh, the mother of the family would use all her spare time in many cases to, to, uh, to sit at the sewing machine making clothing for her, for her family. The, the men wear long uncut beards and no mustache. If you see a man with a beard and a mustache, he's probably not Amish. And uh, the hats are always worn outside and taken off inside. And here you see a slide. Uh, I was at a, a, a public gathering at a, a well-known restaurant called, uh, uh, now I forget the name of the restaurant, but um, uh, there were lots and lots of Amish men at this meeting. And there you can see all their hats, their straw hats. Uh, Lancaster County Amish wear straw hats mostly. Uh, other Amish in other parts of the country might wear different kinds of hats, but. Here you can see that they, they didn't, there, weren't, there wasn't enough room on the shelvy, shelves for all the hats, but they, sure, they surely did take them off when they came inside. Um, and, and always, always they wear hats uh, on, when they're outside. The trousers that men would wear don't have zippers, so they have, they're called broad fall. They would have a series of uh, five or six uh, buttons across the top, right under the belt which would be open for them to when they need to relieve themselves. Things like that, uh, very distinctive. Distinctive haircuts um, uh, that the men wear and the young boys as well. And the women always wear their heads covered uh, when they, uh, especially when they're outside, when they're in, even do indoors most of the time, hair is pulled straight back. It's completely unadorned. Uh, there's no makeup, no lipstick, no jewelry, and the uh, plain long dresses all the way to the ankles for the women. So. Amish are very identifiable by their dress, by their clothing. Now, most people can't think and talk about this without uh, pointing out, especially if they come close to the Amish at all, that there are some inconsistencies that the rest of us might, might note. For, for example, they, can, they are not allowed to own cars, but they can hire people to uh, take them places and they can ride in cars. They're not allowed to have telephones in their cars, in their houses, in their homes but it's okay for them to use their neighbor's telephone. Uh, uh, in horse progress, it, you'll see it, yeah, at horse progress days, uh, you might see a four cart, which is a, a cart that horses would pull with maybe a power takeoff on it. And then those engines on some of the four carts that are demonstrated at horse progress days could have hundred horsepower or 125 or maybe 150, even as high as 150. And so we might say, well, if you're gonna put that big a, an engine on a cart for horses to pull, why not just have the, the gears and the, and the tires and, and just make it a tractor? Uh, the Amish are not allowed to fly except for uh, very serious health reasons, but they can sail. Uh, they could take a boat uh, to come to Europe uh, and they have at times. And the community does, in spite of all this, remain stubbornly intact. It's growing, it has doubled uh, in the last 20 years. I think the Amish population has doubled. So if that continues, There'll be uh, even a lot more Amish in, in uh, North America in the future, in future years. So one of the questions might be, what keeps them in within those boundaries? What keeps those outside boundaries intact? Well, there's the safety of belonging to a small community of people, the security of being part of something important. Um, they do inter the Amish do intermingle in everyday life. 
but they're very protective of their religious practices and uh, their times like Sunday morning worship and weddings and funerals and self and, and uh, education are all very private and they and they guard them very carefully. Um, and they, the Amish do not educate their young people beyond eighth grade. Um, and so when we when you see a little bit later some of the innovations that we talked about talk about with horse farming, especially as it's represented in horse progress days, you, you want to try to remember that all that you see and when what you see will just be the very tip of the iceberg, but what all that you see comes from people who have an, have an education only to the eighth grade, through the eighth grade. And so you won't see doctors or lawyers uh, represented in the Amish communities, but, but uh, entrepreneurs and engineer types abound. So we're ready for the next slide then. Um, and we'll talk a little bit the, about the gift of Amish ingenuity to communities at large. So it's that stubborn and determined commitment to uh, rel their religious beliefs, actually, that leads to the gift of Horse Progress Days to uh, the rest of us, the rest of the world. Horse Progress Days began in 1994 and it's been held every year since, except for last year, 2020, because of the pandemic. It rotates to six different Amish communities east of the Mississippi River, uh, places where there are lots of horses to demonstrate the equipment, lots of horses that are used to working, custom to working. And the purpose of the event is to showcase newly manufactured horse-drawn farming equipment behind real animals in real field conditions. Now that's an important distinction. The newly manufactured is very important because it's not an event that demonstrates antique equipment. There are quite a, quite a number of those events in our part of the world and maybe some in yours as well. Um, and they're very good uh, for uh, building a foundation or, or establishing a, a foundation under what's uh, offered at Horse Progress Days. But the, the Horse Progress Days equipment that's demonstrated is generally new equipment or uh, retrofitted in some cases, uh, but mostly new. And all the designs come from within the Amish community. Um, uh, and, and at Horse Progress Days, almost every year, uh, something new shows up that uh, someone is working on, a manufacturer is working on, based on probably a need that came from his own experience or that, the, or that of his neighbors, something that he saw in his community that he thinks that he might be able to fulfill with this newly designed equipment. So we're ready then for the pictures now of the Narvon mower. Um, this is a new uh, piece of equipment that has uh, just been released to the market, I believe, this year. It was going to debut in 2020 at Horse Progress Days, but it was, of course, couldn't because we didn't have the event. But um, this is a mower that is designed especially for uh, grazing operations, grazing, uh, dairy grazing, beef, graze, beef cattle grazing, uh, sheep, and so on is becoming much more important here. And by the way, I might mention too, there was a question somewhere along the way, are the Amish, are Amish farming practices biological, uh, biological? Um, and the answer is some, sometimes, but not always. Um, some of the, I would, I would venture to guess that in the Amish community, uh, those who are farming, uh, the percentage was of, of, of organic versus conventional would probably be somewhat similar to the, uh, the larger uh, non-Amish farming community. Um, there is a movement within the Amish uh, community to, to uh, pursue organic farming, biological farming, but, um, and it's growing. And some of the practices that the Amish would, uh, would have done uh, would sort of support biological farming, but by and large, uh, that is not a requirement. That's not within the outside boundaries uh, of their um, practices, unfortunately. Um, so this nor new Narvon mower that we're seeing here is designed for one horse, as you see it here. And this is an older horse um, that, and this, the farmer who designed this mower, it's the only horse he has. He doesn't have any draft horses. Um, he only has this one buggy horse, and that's the horse he uses to power, to pull this little, um, uh, interesting little piece of equipment. It's got a small engine, about a four horsepower engine with an, with 
an ESM cutter bar on it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that ESM cutter bar later. That's a German company that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, was uh, found its way to INJ Manufacturing, a local uh, manufacturer here, Amish owned manufacturer uh, that has used it, the, uh, the relationship very successfully in the, the uh, mowers that he manufactures. The, this, uh, this mower, Zhao, you could go to number 15, maybe slide, the next slide. Um, it has a floating bar, this mower, uh, and it can be adjusted from three to 14 inches. Now there's the bar uh, and, and the, you, you can see the, on the corner there of the frame, there's a piece of uh, belting, I guess it is, heavy belting that um, helps to absorb the uh, vibrations that the, that the, 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 uh, from, from the cutter bar. And I don't really have a very good picture of how the frame um, is, is um, attached to uh, the rest of the mower to make it, to let it float a little bit so that if it hits a rock in the field or, uh, and also of course to absorb some of the vibrations. It's a very unique design. I wish I could show it to you a little bit better, but uh, the bar can be adjusted from three inches down, down to three inches or up to 14 inches. You'll have to make the conversion to your, uh, your measurements. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have that. I didn't do that. I should have done that. Um, and as I said, it's designed specifically for management of grazing lands. Um, with, of course, with grazing um, animals or uh, lands, you don't want to cut the, the grass too short, shouldn't be cut too short, um, so that you don't dam damage the sward. And, and all that has been taken into consideration in the design of this new Narvon mower. It's very, very innovative. And that's, that's uh, fairly common. And if you look at that, yeah, here's the picture. If you look at this picture, you, it gives you a pretty good view of this EM, ESM cutter bar. That uh, cutter bar, you can see that the knives are offset a little bit and they, they oscillate against one another. And so they act like a, more of a scissors cutting action. And so that's one of the reasons it takes much less power to uh, cut the crop than it, than it would with the, uh, the old method of, on the international or the IH uh, uh, mowers or, or the other mowers that were made that had uh, the guards and the knives and the knives just you know go against the guards and cut the crop off that way. It takes a lot more power that way. So this, this cutter bar was actually discovered by um, Jake, Jacob Blank, the owner of INJ Manufacturing in Gap, Pennsylvania. He happened to have a conversation with the uh, North American rep of ESM uh, machine, uh, night, uh, cutter, cutting, I'm not sure what the rest of the title of that company is, but it's ESM and they're in, located in Germany. And uh, the, the North American rep said to Jake, I believe I have a bar, a cutter bar that might work in your, on your uh, uh, mowers. And, and, and Jake pursued that. And now Jake is making, uh, uh, INJ is making a uh, mower that's ground drive um, and it's been demonstrated at uh, very stark. May, many of you may have seen it there and it works very, very well. And so here again, uh, this same bar, same uh, cutter, cutter cutting mechanism was, uh, was utilized in the, in the manufacture of this new Narvon mower. So I, I wish I had better pictures of all the innovators that, that uh, uh, now I lost you. Are you still there, Zhao? We are, we are. We can still okay. hear you. My pictures somehow, I touched something that... If you can find it, I'll stop sharing and I'll, I'll bring the presentation back. Uh, um, here we go. Oop. Stop sharing. And I'll share the screen again. No. No, I lost. I lost the picture, Zhao. Can you see it now? Well, we'll keep on here. <clears throat> no, I'm not sure what I did. I touched something on my my laptop here. Oh, here, Zoom. Here, try this. Hmm. That's okay. fine. If you just well, go to Zoom and click it, you'll see yeah, it. If, as long as, yeah, as long as you folks can see what what we're talking about. Yep. So, additional innovators would be uh, White Horse Machine is another company. Uh, Whitehorse uh, developed a, a new mold board for their plow design and a new, a new, uh, actually new, completely new plow design. 
and it's built on the uh, some of the publications from Lynn Miller out in Oregon, Sisters, Oregon. He publishes Small Farmers Journal and uh, Melvin uh, King from White Horse Machine and his sons studied the, the older uh, plows and, and incorporated a lot of the uh, uh, special designs from several different plows into their no, new plow. And it's probably the first new plow design, first uh, new mold board design that has come on board uh, anywhere in, in, the, in the world, possibly in the last 50 to 60 years since so much effort has gone into min, minimal tillage and so on. But this plow, the mold board that that uh, that White Horses has designed, is is designed to take into consideration conservation practices. And, and the way that it does is that it's it 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 stacks the the furrow dirt instead of turning it completely over, it stacks it on its side, so that that if, if it rains between the time when the uh, if there's a heavy rain between the time that the land is the ground is plowed and the time that it's uh, worked up. Uh, for a final seed bed preparation, way for the the water can run in between the furrows and it keeps it keeps runoff uh, from happening so much. And that's a that's a, a, a very nice uh, piece of equipment that White Horses come up with <clears throat> just in the last several years. Plus, they also came up with a uh, what we call a side uh, side hill plow, which is a plow that what you would uh, that goes plows to the right and to the left has two mold boards on it. You go to the end of the row, plowing to the right, turn around and put the other mold board down and, and plow to the left. Um, and so that you're always plowing uphill. You're always pushing the ground uphill. Uh, plus you're not making those long rounds on the outside of the headlands. And there hasn't been a new plow of that design made for many, many years either. And so then when we talk about innovation in the Amish community in terms of horse farming equipment, it, it's very striking. Esch Manufacturing is another company here in Pennsylvania who has come up with a uh, no-till drill. They put a lot of time and effort into. Uh, Pioneer Equipment, of course, out in Ohio. They also came up with a new plow board, uh, mold board uh, that they put in on their plows a number of years ago. And this is a Cavernland plow. <laughs> plow bottom from the country of Sweden, I believe it is. And uh, this one uh, also, uh, it twists the, the, the furrow, the furrow ground, the furrow dirt more rather than hit, hit, hit it like uh, our old Oliver plows here uh, and John Deere plow mold boards were much more abrupt and they, they made the, the, the dirt much more chunky and took more power actually to pull those plows through the ground. Fuel was cheap here in the U.S. and it didn't matter so much, but with uh, with draft horse uh, power, animal power pulling these plows, it's it's nice to have a more efficient use of the of the power and when the, when the mold board turns that dirt over. Then the ship she cultivator. Are you on that slide? That would be uh, the last slide, I think. Um, I am the red one. Yeah. That is a design of cultivulture, we call it. Um, that is a completely new thing that I saw for the first time in Horse Progress Days. Uh, it might be 12 years ago now or more. Um, and it, it's, it's uh, got the uh, Danish tines on it that, that I and Jay made, uh, made uh, popular with their cultivators, uh, which they debuted at the very first Horse Progress Days in 1994. And those, those uh, Danish tines have been used over and over and over again by many, many different manufacturers in different in different uh, applications. Um, and here you can see them on the Shipshi Supply uh, cultivator. Now, Shipshi Supply is from Shipshawana, Indiana, uh, uh, and they 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 came up with well, they saw this design somewhere else actually, and they, they were the ones who. Who built the, the 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 piece and brought it to Claire, Michigan, to demonstrate, and got and and they left. I think they left that event with about a dozen orders uh, to fill uh, when they got home. Uh, machines to build, and this machine with its uh, basket up front, roller basket up front, and roller basket in the back, and then the tine harrows in between, is very efficient in in uh, in making. The trips over the over the field that's being prepared for planting, making fewer trips 
Uh, when I was a child, we used to use a, a disc first, uh, uh, you know, a disc that, that we would pull and then maybe a cult of packer behind it. And then we would work the ground the other way. And then we, we probably worked the ground at least three times before we would plant. And if with the right kind of plow and this piece of equipment, uh, once over with a plow and once over with the cult of mulcher, and it's ready to pl plant. The other thing I might mention about the Amish and their uh, manufacture of equipment is that they do not pursue patents for their equipment. I, I mentioned the cultimulcher here, and I think that's probably, I've seen that cultimulcher design copied more often than anything else, uh, maybe with the exception of the Norse betters. That's another whole story, but um, the cultimulcher has been, has been copied over and over and over again. And generally the Amish when, uh, manufacturers, when they design something new, um, they're not afraid to show it to everyone else. And if someone else wants to build it, they don't, they are welcome to do it. They, the Amish generally consider uh, uh, something that comes to them in the way of innovation like this as a gift. You might say a gift from God um, and something that, that's not theirs to keep, not theirs to, uh, to guard carefully, but to share broadly so that many, many people can benefit from it. Now, when I say um, that uh, the Amish live with many modern restrictions, when it comes to components for building the equipment, uh, there are no restrictions on the components. So uh, ball bearings uh, in, in manure spreaders, stainless steel uh, lengths, chain length for, for the webs and things like that, uh, and uh, composite, composite uh, flooring and sides for the manure spreaders that uh, that, that, that don't break down as, as quickly as wood did in the past and all those kinds of things are all we, are readily incorporated into the manufacture of the equipment. And again, I might remind us that, that all this, um, what we see um, in uh, Amish uh, farming innovations and in equipment these days is all accomplished with just an eighth grade education, something that I'm always very impressed with, but the Amish, um, are very, very focused in their schools on the, cho the, the students uh, uh, mastering the very basics of education like math, arithmetic especially, not, not algebra necessarily or, or uh, geometry or anything like that. Although many Amish uh, will pursue those kinds of, uh, of math, if that kind of math or anything else that they need uh, to do their work, if they find themselves in, in a situation where they need that to, to accomplish what they wanna do. But, but the, the Amish education, reading, writing, and arithmetic, um, of course, no computers in the classrooms, uh, no television uh, in the homes, uh, no video games. Um, and, and, and this is what we see coming. I, I, I often say that I think that the rest of us could, uh, could learn something from uh, the Amish way. So the Amish, at large are, are often considered an oddity and that they could easily put be placed in obsolescence by modern people and they often are. Um, and, but the interesting thing is uh, that if we think about the, the world of draft animal power, draft animal power across the world, across the whole world, uh, the size of the horses and mules here that we have in, in North America and the equipment that we use would be obsolete in many parts of the world, but for the opposite reason that Westerners place Amish farming practices in obsolescence. But there is a strong attraction to Horse Progress Day's event to uh, many parts of the developing world. We've seen this uh, over the years. It's, it's been a surprise to me and, and a pleasant surprise uh, to think that, that there might be something in the way of Amish farming that could possibly help to meet the needs of hungry people around the world. Uh, we have a strong history now of international guests to the event from every continent in the, in the world. Um, and there is a, a pretty strong desire, a, well, I would say a very strong desire in the Amish communities to help meet the needs of needy people in needy places. Um, and so this gift of Amish enterprise and innovation, is it, I guess the question is, would it be possible, is it possible somehow to, to use it 
uh, this gift uh, in, other, in parts of the world where, um, where people are hungry and farming practices could be improved maybe you have been interrupted by uh, wars and civil wars and, and despotic leaders. Um, is there a way for uh, Amish ingenuity to be um, utilized in that part of the world? Well, uh, in, for, for the year 2020, of course, Horse Progress Days was postponed, but that last year, uh, there's actually a program that I've been involved with and I'm pretty excited about um, it's sponsored by Horse Progress Days, uh, working with uh, an organization called Mennonite Central Committee. Mennonite Central Committee is a, uh, or MCC, is an aid organization with a multi-million dollar um, budget, um, annual budget. And the plan was to host an ag engineer from Tanzania to come to the Lancaster County Amish community to live with an Amish family, work in an Amish shop, and the, and the uh, hope would be to produce a piece of equipment or something, some kind of equipment that would be useful in the Arusha region of Tanzania. And the, the, the uh, experiment would use only components and methods that can be replicated in that region. And uh, the Amish community, of course, they're unable to travel to distant places to fulfill uh, uh, requests to come and help us. And so this would be an attempt to bring uh, bring someone from uh, a, a, um, another, from a developing part of the world to uh, a Lancaster County Amish, the Lancaster County Amish community to work together in the hopes of, of, of uh, finding a way to improve the lot of farmers in Tanzania. And of course, we know that there are many more animals used worldwide to produce food than, than uh, modern tractors. Um, I recently had the uh, opportunity to uh, participate in uh, the uh, conference that uh, was, was uh, managed by Klaus Krop. Uh, the title was Draft Animal, Past, Present, and Future. Um, a very interesting, I thought, um, uh, uh, conference and very uh, um, informative. And I'm becoming more and more aware of the uh, 2030 Millennium Goals of the FAO, the Food Aid Organization of the United Nations. And, and so then the question, for me uh, becomes, uh, and the question that sort of motivates me to think beyond uh, the local Amish community and Horse Progress Days event itself is, could Amish equipment innovations somehow be applied to de developing parts of the world to alleviate hunger? So that's pretty much what I have uh, to present today. I'd like to again uh, express my appreciation for the work of FEC2 and and also the donkey sanctuary and um, the World uh, Animal Alliance um, sponsors of uh, uh, that who work together for uh, to promote uh, draft animal farming in uh, various parts of the world. Thanks for the invitation to meet with you today. Uh, thanks for your efforts in promoting the use of draft animals in Western Europe and beyond. And I would say that. Uh, it is possible uh, to have Amish uh, made equipment shipped to various parts of the world with uh, shipping uh, networks that are in place for those who might wish to avail themselves of it. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, Reiner Wazowski, a German man, a man from Southern Germany has uh, been um, filling um, containers, shipping containers for uh, a number of years, sometimes two and three times a year to bring this equipment. Of course, we've, you've seen it demonstrated at Fair to Start. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the exchange program that I talked about uh, just, uh, just a brief, uh, just a little bit ago is not, is not a way for, uh, it's not looking for new, new markets for Amish made equipment. Uh, this, this would be uh, just simply an exchange program. And it's my deep belief that if this program actually comes to pass that we will find ways of, of doing things here um, in the U.S. on our small farm, within our small, small farm movement that we hadn't thought of before. And so my hope is that if, if this actually comes to pass, there will be, and my belief is, that there will be benefits uh, to everyone. I might also mention, uh, I, I'm sure most of you are aware of the Equid Power Network website that Jao set up, uh, Jao Rodriguez set up. 
and uh, and that too that is also supported by FEC2, the Donkey Sanctuary, and the World Horse Welfare. Uh, and that's a very extensive listing from all over the world of all kinds of things related to horses. Uh, a very good uh, source uh, of, uh, of uh, support. So that's what I have, Zhao. Um, are there any questions? Um, thanks a lot, Dale. Thanks, thanks for sharing your experience and all the, the useful information that you, you gave us here today. We have two questions here. I also have one. The first question is from Amy McLean, and she says, which Amish communities are allowed to use mules and which are not? Ah, I know in yeah. some communities you only see draft horses, for example, Ohio, but mules in Pennsylvania. That's the first question. Okay, that, that's a good question. Uh, and there again, the tradition determines that in Pennsylvania, mules are probably more popular than horses, although horses have gained ground in the last uh, 20 years. I think partly because of the horse, the uh, draft horse sale that I mentioned earlier that was held in, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, and now, uh, and, and yes, you're right, Zhao, uh, there are parts of Ohio that would, uh, where the Amish churches would not allow the use of, of mules, but then there also are parts, of the, and, and the Amish um, practices among, among the Amish are very, very, pretty, pretty much from, from community, community to community. Uh, so there would be some Amish in Ohio where mules would not be allowed because they're considered unnatural. They're a hybrid, you know, between a, 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 a draft horse mare and a, and a mammoth jack. Uh, and, and, uh, but it, it, there, the mule use is growing. I found this year, uh, Horse Progress Days will be held in Mount Hope, Ohio. And in, in preparation for that, I learned that there are more mules in Ohio, I believe now, than, than there have, had been. They're becoming more popular. It, it, slowly. So, uh, and Northern Indiana, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. That's the, uh, so the biggest Amish communities would be Pennsylvania, Eastern Pennsylvania, where I live and Ohio, Holmes County, Wayne County, Tuscarawas County, Ohio, uh, would be very close to the same as, as, uh, the Lancaster or the Eastern Pennsylvania group. And then Northern Indiana would be the next largest group. And I'm not sure, uh, there aren't many mules used in that community either. It's, it's interesting to note that in, in a faithful, well, uh, uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, it's almost more faithful to use mules than horses. But in Ohio and Indiana, it's almost more faithful to use um, horses than mules. So that's another of those, what we would consider maybe inconsistencies, but but in the community, but it's just a way that that the, the that the most important thing to remember when we think about um, Amish uh, ways of doing things is that the agreement the the, the, uh, the agreement that uh, uh, goes on within a community that establishes those outside boundaries I talked about and makes the group a group uh, makes them a community makes them a, and gives them a distinct flavor and a place in the larger, in the broader culture. Thanks, Dale. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, Amy McLean is a, is a, a specialist in, in mules. So that's, oh. she works in at UC Davis. So I believe that's why Amy was, was asking that. And wow. her family, her family breathed donkeys and mules for many, many years. So that's why. Ah, nice. uh, another question here is, it's a technical question from Peter Harold from, from Germany says, so the duty of the, the, the hat mower, the one you presented is to catch what the animals didn't feed. Is that correct? Say that again. I'm sorry, Joe. Uh, in terms of the, the the main function of the mower that you present, oh, yeah. uh, is that to cut the grass or the the, the hay that the animals didn't feed? Yes, yes. Yep. It's to maintain the, the. It's not. Yeah. It's to maintain the uh, meadow, the grass. It, it's not generally won't be used for harvesting or making hay, yeah, and and that's why the adjustment to 14 inches. I don't think we have anything else, any other mower that would mow that high. Um, but in grazing, of course, if, as I'm sure you're aware, um, the animals are, are not too, it's, it's best that the animals don't chew the grass down too far toward the, toward the earth uh, so that it, it can grow back quickly and, 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 and safely, you know, and, and keep and live for a long time, not be trampled underfoot. 
Thanks, Lil. I do have a question for you that it's, although it's not directly linked with the Amish community, because the Amish community, I think, is the paradigmatic example that you have in the US that can also be linked with that. That is, what is the general perception of the use of draft animals in the US? Well, I'd say that the, the general perception of the use of draft animals in the US is, is that they would be connected to uh, ancient history. Um, they would be uh, considered, uh, I don't know if you know the, you know the word Luddite. In other words, it would be uh, going, being, being um, uh, strapped or, or manacled to the past. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's sort of interesting. In, on the one hand, on, in one way, the Amish way of doing things uh, is considered uh, pastoral and, and uh, you know, very appealing. But in other ways, uh, many people think of the Amish ways of doing things, and especially horse farming, as uh, just a, a, a relic of the past and, and associated with hard work and drudgery and, and uh, Turning, turning one's back on, on modern innovations. Does that answer your question? Yes, or yes, but, but uh, what, what about outside the, the Amish community? Do you still have a group of farmers or a group of oh. users who are, who are actually promoting animal traction in the, in the US? And what is the, the, the general perception of, of the public about the use of draft animals? Are you going on that direction that people is trying to uh, forbid the use of animals, you know, being too protective in relation with the animals? Uh, or people uh. accept that as something uh, that may be part of the future? What, what is the general perception? Well, I think there's there's some of that, uh, you know, wanting to protect the animals, but it's not, it hasn't been a real problem here like it has in some places. Um, it seems like, I, I would say that, that in general, uh, the perception of horses in the US is, there's a very strong, uh, of course, pleasure horse uh, group. There's a very strong show horse group, jumping, hunter jumpers, uh, race horses. Um, and so I think m most people consider, think of the Amish workhorses fitting into those patterns. Uh, as far as the use of animals for farming, uh, horses for farming outside of the Amish community, I don't really have a good a grasp of that, except that in, I would say, you know, I've had some conversations with some of the manufacturers who say uh, at, at times, I'm not sure what they would say now. I haven't had that conversation for a while, but I know you know, whenever fuel gets short or uh, uh, whenever, I, I, you know, it, it seems like it comes sort of in waves. They'll have uh, lots of activity uh, on equipment from outside the community and then maybe it hits a law and then maybe there's another wave. Um, but I, I can't say that that interest in, in animal, draft animal farming, draft horse farming in the U.S. is growing outside the Amish community by leaps and bounds. But I do think that if, if, if the general public would pay a, a little bit more attention to um, the Amish way of farming, uh, which is more, you know, more small and more efficient, I think there would be benefits. I'm sure there would be benefits from that. I spent, personally, myself, I spent about 20 some years uh, as a realtor, uh, selling real estate, helping people find homes and, and farms. And um, there were, I was amazed at the number of Amish farmers who were able to buy farms when conventional farmers didn't seem to be able to, to get the money together. Uh, I think the, 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 the uh, economic power in the Amish community is, is, is very underestimated. The Amish in general are quite wealthy um, and, and partly because of, of the way that they approach, approach uh, uh, commercial activity uh, in, in a frugal way uh, and a careful way, but also it, in terms of farming, the uh, amount of capital that it takes to start to, to establish a, a conventional farm with big tractors, you know, $150,000 tractors compared to uh, eight horses that might cost, let's say they cost uh, right now, the, the horse market is pretty strong. Let's say, you know, you, you need eight horses at, at, at $8,000 a piece, that's 64,000, right? So uh, but that's all your power for the whole farm. So in comparison to uh, uh, equipping a 
a conventional farm, equipping a, 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 an Amish farm is much, much less. And, and, and you're talking about an extreme, right? Because apart from a few examples, we, we may not have that many farms in Europe where we need eight horses, you know, even in Europe, the, yeah, the reality sure. is, is right. quite different. It's uh, farming with horses is directly linked with small farming or small medium farming system. Uh, yeah. when, when I see the amount of land that a, an Amish farm may cultivate, you know, it, it blows my mind because that's bigger than most of the conventional farms using tractor that we see, for example, in Portugal, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just a, my, my, my reality. Right, but the interesting thing, the interesting thing then is that, in, that at an Amish horse farm here in the U.S. compared to a conventional farm of a thousand acres, is is very very small. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a question of scale. <laughs> yeah, but the but it works for the Amish. It works. Yep, we we can see that as as I told you before. I think it was a a, a paradigmatic example of how to farm with with horses is is possible, right? Yes. I don't know if there is any last question in in the room. Well, if there's no question, Dale, once again, thank you so much for sharing your experience and all your knowledge about the the Amish community. It's something that personally I was quite fascinated when I was there with you and I, I could be with the community for even for a couple of days and see uh, all the dedication from those manufacturers that for me was quite impressive and to see, as you said, people coming from that specific background, reaching that level of expertise in terms of animal traction, it was really, really, really interesting. So once again, thank you so much for sharing for sharing your, your experience. It's, it was a pleasure on behalf of FACTU. You're, you're, Thanks a lot. You're welcome. And, and, and I would just say too, Zhao, that I would, I would welcome anyone uh, who's listening or listens to this YouTube who has interest to come to Horse Progress Days. And if you do come, make sure that we know that you're here. We're always interested in knowing uh, and greeting our uh, friends from other parts of the world, international guests, we call you. And we have a special time uh, at the event every, every uh, Friday and Saturday at noon to uh, greet you in a more formal way. So everyone is most certainly invited to come to visit Horse Progress Days when they can. Thank you so much, and I, I was very well received by by you and by the the Amish community. So it was it was a great experience. So yeah, people feel welcome to visit the the horse progress. This is a is an incredible event. Okay, so on that note, Dale, once again, thank you so much. I hope to see you soon. Stay safe, and for those who join us today, thank you so much for coming. It was a pleasure to have you. Thanks for the for the questions, and hope to see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Have a okay, good day. Bye bye. Thank you, Dale. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you, Dale. Thank you so much. You're welcome. There I can see you again. I'm, I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> That's fine. Thanks a lot, my friend.